Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Nutritional Revolution podcast. We have an amazing guest for you guys today. We have Brie Reddick here. She is a current PhD student in feminist studies at UC Santa Barbara, and she has been published in several magazines, uh, Nation Magazine, Century Foundation, Womenly Magazine, YR Media, and The Rag, and she has her own uh, business website that she explores the intersection of social justice and menstruation. And she is currently the editor of the rag, a blog that's operated by the company called period. So quite the, the history. Um, so if you couldn't tell you guys, we are diving into all things menstruation today and, uh, menstrual inequality, very interesting topic. So this is a big eye opener to me recently with a book I read. And so I thought Brie could come on here and help us break down a lot of this stuff that, um, that I was very much unaware of, and I think is great to share and get out there. So how did you get into this whole world, Brie? Yeah, thank you for that introduction. It's always so nice to hear other people say the things that you can. <laughs> wow, you feel validated. Exactly. So I got introduced to period. I graduated from college in 2019, and I was really lost. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had applied to probably like over 200 jobs and hadn't received any. Wow. So I ended up actually working for a tech company, which was fine, but I just really wasn't passionate about it. And so then I, the company Salt, S-A-A-L-T. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, they had an Instagram giveaway where they were giving away one of their menstrual cups mm -hmm. and like a couple of other things like a blanket and like a silk eye mask. I don't know. It was like yeah. a random thing. And I just, I did it because I was interested in menstrual cups. I'd always kind of been interested. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm just like a, someone that's gravitates naturally towards like more environmentally friendly products. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I actually won the, the, giveaway. Awesome. And I got the menstrual cup and I was like, okay, now I need to learn how to use it. And mm. it was a really intense learning curve for me as someone yeah. that probably like was really adverse to my own body. And like, in order to use the menstrual cup, you have to be really intimate with yourself. You have mm -hmm. to be able to look at places that were <laughs> conditioned to not look at. Um, right. You have to be very comfortable seeing your own blood um, mm -hmm. and that process of getting to know my body in that intimate way kind of like revolutionized a lot of things for me as someone that you know has past experience of you know trauma and feeling like my body was not my own mm -hmm. my menstrual cup kind of was a reclamation for me and allowed me to kind of be like, wow, I do have a say in how my body experiences things. You know, I feel like since we were, since I was a child, I was told like, you're going to have your period for this amount of time. And it, you have no choice. It's going to suck. You're going to hate it. And that was the truth. Like I did mm -hmm. hate my period and it was something that I just felt like I had no control over and kind of like further cemented the idea that like, women don't have autonomy of their own bodies. Like it's mm. every, it's like, you know, the curse of mother nature is like mm. a woman's burden. Mm -hmm. And so for me, having an alternative period product that wasn't a tampon or a pad, which I didn't find was compatible with my lifestyle, mm -hmm. really eye-opening. And I realized I started to talk to the other people around me and I was like, have you used a menstrual cup? And they're all like, ew, no, I would never do that. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, it's so interesting that, you know, I'm talking to women in my family who just are really disgusted by the idea of like being that intimate and close with their own body. And so I started to explore kind of like the social experience of mm. menstruating and what does it mean to menstruate in a world that kind of hates people who menstruate mm -hmm. and you know a lot of menstruators have internalized that hate for their bodies for their period and I'm not saying you have to love your period I don't love my period mm -hmm. but I think that um I've definitely reshaped the way I've thought about my period um and so I started to explore things um, explore kind of, you know, the social repercussions of menstru menstruation. And I quickly got involved with period. And I've been here for now about two years. And I'm still exploring, you know, different 
things about period. I'm still learning a bunch of new things. Um, but I'm really interested in the social impact of menstruators. Um, mm. Yeah. Awesome. I think all that's amazing. I think we will, we will be diving into more menstrual cup talk in our conversation today. Um, but talking about the, um, writing for period, do you have a favorite blog post that you wrote or got to work on or research about? Um, so the thing that I love about the rag is that we have so many different people reach out to us. Um, and you know, we use personal narratives and essays to, cut through that period stigma that mm. you know, allows our stories to like die in silence. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, we recently published a blog about a menstruator who, well, not a menstruator, but someone who uh, was menopaused at 16 and that. Mm. Oh, wow. Right. It's like, you know, you, no one thinks about what mm -hmm. it means to menopause, like mm -hmm. before you're you know, an even adult. Yeah. Um, and so that was like a really interesting perspective that I was, um, I don't know, just like struck a chord with me because mm -hmm. I think that we, there's just so many stories about menstruation that just go untold because, mm -hmm. we can, you know, we can't, even, most of us can't even walk to the bathroom without hiding our menstrual products. Right. And so you have these really intricate really intimate stories that end up being like super marginalized because we can't even tell the most basic of stories. And so mm -hmm. I think what I love about the rag is that people can go and tell these like very intimate stories about themselves. And it can be like a healing process to write about it. For me, it absolutely was to write mm -hmm. about my journey of using a menstrual cup. Mm -hmm. And so even just giving a voice to people who like, we recently just published a piece about a menstrual activist who basically just like was a badass and was able to get her local um like city council to sponsor like free products in amazing county. and yeah it's just like and she was in high school oh my gosh and I'm That's like awesome <laughs> it's crazy the things that I think one of the cool things about the rag and period and the menstrual movement is that it's predominantly youth-led so you have like these you know teenagers leading this revolution wow. about you know, our periods and our bodies and autonomy. And I think that it's really cool to just see the actual people and like hear their story who are leading this movement. That is amazing. I can't imagine like thinking back to when I was in like middle school and starting my period, it was like, nobody talked about it. Like you would right. absolutely hide your tampons or like, or, oh my goodness, you use tampons. Like, mm -hmm. versus, you know, it was, uh, yeah, definitely. Like in no way would you like talk about it in front of a boy. <laughs> like, right. Exactly. Uh, it's, uh, but yeah, now with the, the field we're in now, I mean, we do a lot of sex difference in sport education and talk about how menstrual cycle hormones will change, mm -hmm. gosh, how they perform and stuff like that. And so talking about menstruation is a very regular thing now between me and my female clients or menopause and stuff like that too. Um, which I think is good. It, it is good to kind of, you know, talk about that more. Like you're saying a lot of people maybe will cringe or like it, you know, blush or, you know, if they start talking about that kind of stuff. And I think it is something that doesn't, it doesn't need to be that way. Um, so we keep talking a little bit about menstrual cups. So I think, um, I want to dive into this a little bit because I've had my own struggles with menstrual cups or I guess a menstrual cup. And that's as far as I went with it. So um, and we currently too are in the times of a tampon shortage, apparently, um, according to the news. So maybe we can dive into a little bit about like, what, like what even is a menstrual cup and how, like, kind of, how do you use it? Do you throw it away after every use? I, I know the answer to some of these questions, but I want you to help, help our listeners kind of like learn a bit about uh, a bit more about menstrual cups and maybe even where they can find them. And if there's certain ones that you like, or that are maybe made from better products and others, um, share, share some of that stuff with us. Brie. Yeah, totally. So menstrual cups, they come in all shapes and sizes. You really do. I would say have to do your research. I mm -hmm. think that it's interesting. I'm definitely seeing like a shift in culture. I mean, I think when we go even seeing like 
the turn towards clean beauty Mm -hmm. or like stopping fast fashion. I think that there is definitely some type of like public consciousness Mm -hmm. about um, just like more eco-friendly products. And so I've definitely seen, especially I would say like since the pandemic, people are at home and they probably feel more comfortable trying out a new period product. Mm -hmm. Looking at, you know, period panties Mm -hmm. or menstrual cups, et cetera. And so I will say that you have to, you know, it's not a one size fits all, you know, Mm -hmm. some people have, I learned that, for example, I have a really high uterus. And so for me, a thinner, like skinnier menstrual cup, that's kind of longer rather than Mm -hmm. wider Mm -hmm. is better. And it's more comfortable. Whereas some of the wider ones, so I use the Diva Cup, okay, um, which is kind of like the pinnacle. I feel like mm-hmm. I'm the first in the game to really do yeah. it in like a big way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I use I used the Salt Cup for a really long time, but I definitely it was I would say it wasn't as comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, menstrual cups are essentially they're really simple. Um, mm-hmm. Depending on which one you get, they can last for up to ten years. Wow! If used, you know, and cl- cleaned correctly. Mm-hmm. But basically, they're just usually made out of silicone, mm-hmm. um, and there's different methods of folding them. Mm-hmm. You have to just find what you're comfortable with. But yeah, I would say that my tip for using a menstrual cup is you really have to relax. Mm. similar to when you get like a pap smear Mm -hmm. they're all tensed up and so it would hurt more when it goes in yeah you really have to relax your muscles and once you relax your muscles it'll go in much easier Mm -hmm. but again I would say that if you're uncomfortable with I would say menstrual cups are not for people that are uncomfortable with any type of like penetration or insertion Mm. so if you're Mm -hmm. not really comfortable with tampons I wouldn't say that menstrual cup I wouldn't personally recommend first um menstrual cups as yeah method but I think the really positive thing about menstrual cups is I can keep mine in for a really long time I mm-hmm. mean I wouldn't keep it in more than 12 hours mm-hmm. but in my experience I don't leak um mm-hmm. I don't really I have a really heavy period mm-hmm. and so menstrual cups really allowed me to not have to go to the bathroom every two minutes to change my tampon. Also, I experienced a lot of vaginal dryness with Mm. tampons. Mm -hmm. Um, And I noticed like just during intercourse, it would just become painful Mm -hmm. because they wouldn't even be able to like lubricate themselves because the tampons were just so drying. Yeah. And I even realized that once I had the menstrual cup, I was cramping less. Mm. Um, I just felt so much better about it, but it took a really, it was definitely a learning curve. I would mm-hmm. say it's harder to take it out than it mm. is to put it in. Oh yeah. Um, Do you but, have any tips? <laughs> ah. So you don't make a mess. I, I know that's like <laughs> my fear. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have been using a menstrual cup probably now for about like five years mm-hmm. and I still do not feel comfortable use taking it out in public places mm-hmm. um, I am a homebody so mm-hmm. I'm home a lot so I will usually I like to take it out in the shower mm-hmm. basically I think a learning curve that people have to come to terms with is you don't pull it out by the stem like you would mm-hmm. necessarily a tampon, but you kind right. of like go in further, break the seal, and then mm. pull it out. Yeah, um, which can be really scary. And you know, I like the shower idea though. That's I yeah. mean, I think that's probably a easy way to ease people into it. I did. Oh goodness, there was one celebrity that I remember was sharing her story about her menstrual cup. I don't know if you've heard this, and she was saying that when she Cause you're talking about the seal, right? That it like, it's, it has like the silicone like opening and it can, can suction. I think some of the companies now have put little like holes right in the, mm-hmm. um, kind of rim of the cup, but, um, she was saying she was trying to pull it, pull it out. It sounds like probably from the stem, like you're mm-hmm. saying, and it, she said it suctioned. And then it, I think when she was pulling it, it like basically pulled a nerve and she fainted oh, like, yeah. God. So I, I'd never heard of that, but you know, 
I, you gotta, you, like you're saying, you have to like, you can't just like pull it from the stem. You have to, you know, get a couple fingers in there to like <laughs> loosen up that seal oh, and God. be comfortable with that. Um, but apparently there's a nerve down there that, that, you know, I, maybe it makes some people faint and others not, I don't know, but that was super interesting. I'd never heard of that. Yeah. Another uh, thing uh, is, I just want to say that you cannot use a menstrual cup if you have an IUD. Oh, I never knew that. Yeah. Well, and That's why right. is that? The suction is just like not good. It can oh, actually like pull it out or something, maybe. IUD, yeah. Which is something that's like not mentioned. Yeah, that is very interesting. I was not aware of that. Um, with the menstrual cup for our listeners, do you use that through your entire period? Do you ever use other methods of menstrual care products, or is it menstrual cup carries you through the whole thing? Yeah. So I think that. I use the menstrual cup for my heavier days Mm -hmm. and then I like to use period panties Mm -hmm. um, for the days that I'm like a little lighter. Yeah. Um, once again, that is a, I wouldn't say a learning curve, but a social curve because you know, it's uncomfortable sometimes, but I just personally for me, I just can't get back into tampons. I've tried Mm. and I just get extreme cramping after I do that. So interesting. Um, And I just, don't buy pads. So I use, um, I use period panties for like the lighter days and I have ones for heavier days and ones for lighter days, but again, do your research on period panties because I just learned that the company that I use my period panties for is, has a class action lawsuit against them for toxins. Oh, sure. (laughs) Yikes. Interesting. Okay. Um, I mean, that's really good to know. I mean, from a, like a being kind of wise for the planet situation is like, if someone didn't want to, like you're saying, have something that's in, that they have to insert in themselves, tampons or, um, a cup, you'd think go the menstrual panties route or period panties route. But yeah, do like you said, do your research. There's also reusable pads, which I've never used, Mm. but are something that's very popular in other parts of the world. And Mm -hmm. I've definitely seen like my roommate, uh, uses reusable pads and Cause she's not comfortable with insertion. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, there's different ways. I think that's the part that intrigued me the most by the menstrual cup was like, you're not just filling up the landfill with like all these tampons and, um, and also it's a huge money saver. Like oh my if God. you think about it, oh my goodness, like all the money that women pay over their lifespan in tampons and menstrual care products is bananas. Yeah. Um, so to be able to kind of like make that financially wise decision for yourself and for the environment, I think is like, it seems like a win-win. Um, if you can find like either, like you said, the period panties or the menstrual cup, whichever works best for the the person, um, kind of touching back to like the types of menstrual cups, how I think I had one of my functional medicine doctors, like refer me to a, I thought there was a website. I'll see if I can find it for people listening and put in the show notes, but it was like a questionnaire you would fill out mm-hmm. online that you could just go to. And it was a couple questions. And I thought it, 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 it would give you a menstrual cup type suggestion somehow based off of like the answers. And I, I think it somehow had to do with like your, like you're saying your, your uterus or not your, not your uterus your size, but like cervix size. Yeah. yeah. Right. I um, think it's uterus. Yeah. And so like, how did you just trial and error and, and discover that the, like the taller menstrual cups worked better and then you just assumed you have a taller cervix or so did your OBGYN say actually, that? Um, the quiz you're talking about is the put a cup in it, right? Ah, but yes, that sounds familiar. Um, so it's a put a cup in it. You can just Google that. I'm actually, so I was having, when I started using the salt cup, I was like really, really craving to talk to somebody else about it. But I started using a menstrual cup like kind of five years ago and like mm. weren't kind of, no one around me was also using a menstrual cup. So I joined, I'm trying to find it, a Facebook group. Um, oh, cool. Like, I think it's literally a put a cup in it. Um, groups. Uh, yeah, put a cup in it community and nice. it's a Facebook group where all of these menstruators, like just who use menstrual cups, talk about it and people will share funny stories or people ask questions. And so That's one awesome. day I was like, 
I think I don't remember what I said, but I was experiencing some type of weird symptom in mm. my menstrual cup. And someone's like, you probably have like a uterus, I mean, not a uterus, a cervix that's like a higher cervix. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think what it was doing is, I think it was like flipping, like kind of sideways. Oh, well, yeah. So it would leak. Yeah. And so I asked them, I was like, how do I ask people in the community? And they're like, you should try like a different shape. Interesting. And so that's how I ended up with the Diva Cup. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I did more research, and I have had no problems with the Diva Cup. That's great. I'm gonna have to. I have to do a little bit more research because the one I have, I don't think is like you're saying the right right fit for me. Um, I experienced some leaking issues with it too, so I get like nervous. Like you're saying, going out in public and stuff like that. Um, so I will. I'll have to do that put a cup in it, and do some research and play around with some different options. Um, are there, are there, you mentioned salt cup and diva cup. Are there any other menstrual cup companies that you know of that are like promising or you've had friends or people that have success with? Um, there's, where is the brand? There's a disc out now. Oh yeah. Flex or something like that. Flex, I think. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Flex has their own, um, Flex has their own, uh, what do you call it? Um, menstrual cup as well. Mm -hmm. but they also have a disc, which I've never used, but it's disposable. Oh, interesting. Um, and one of the large marketing parts of it is that you can have sex within it. Huh. Um, I wouldn't be the one to tell you if that works because I've never yeah. done it, but interesting. Yeah. Um, that is one of the major uh, marketing. Yeah. Things. Tactics they're using the angle. Yeah. yeah that would, that's interesting to have to do some trial and error. <laughs> just to it's kind of expensive about, for something yeah. that's disposable. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So let's see, talking about kind of the a little bit of the financial freedom that can come to with the menstrual cups. Do you, do you have any stats by any chance about menstrual care products or how much we maybe spend? Or like, I know too, I've heard the term pink tax or women are getting this kind of like um, increase in price on like women products or products for females, um, all that stuff. So if you have anything to share in that arena. Yeah, I think it's about like, so for the specific, um, question of how much do people spend on menstrual products I think it was about like six seven six to seven thousand dollars like the average wow spend that much on period products in her lifetime wow um, don't quote me that on that specifically yeah look it up, but um I can say like oh excuse me um period poverty is something that is really instrumental to obviously the company I work for period. And it's one of our major missions, mm -hmm. but it's also something that's talked about in a really weird way. I think mm -hmm. that people think period poverty and they straight, they, their instincts take them to the global South. Mm -hmm. So they're like, Oh, people in Africa, people in India, people in, you know, different like South Asia. I think that there's like this really warped idea of what period poverty is. And so I can give you the actual definition of period poverty. Yes, please. Period poverty is the limited or inadequate access to menstrual products or menstrual health education as a result of financial constraint or negative sociocultural stigmas associated with menstruation. So period poverty can be literally not having the resources to access um, menstrual management tools but it can also be cultural stigma that forbids people from actually like getting the peer, the access that they need. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I do actually have some stats. Um, so uh, a study in 2021 by BMC Women's Health, they that 16.9 million people who menstruate in the US are living in poverty. Oh my goodness. Two thirds of that 16.9 million low income menstruators in the U S could not afford menstrual products in the past year. Wow. And half of those, um, of that 16.9 million needed to choose between menstrual products and food. Wow. And so, you know, there's this idea that 
period poverty doesn't exist here because it's maybe not as explicit, Mm -hmm. but it's very, very real in the United States and in the West in general. Um, Yeah. You know, it's just hidden because once again, we're really uncomfortable talking about periods. Yeah. Um, And I think that there is this habit of kind of hyper-focusing on the global South to kind of absolve ourselves or the West guilt from having people in our own, you know, and this like hyper capitalist society where like people, you know, aren't supposed to be experiencing period poverty, but they are. Mm-hmm. And it's just maybe not as over as, you know, people free bleeding on themselves in public, mm-hmm. but there's absolutely people, particularly even like college students. I think it's like 16% of college menstruators will experience period poverty wow. and probably like on the lower end. And, you know, as a form, as a current grad student, like I firsthand understand like the financial restrictions that come from being in mm-hmm. school. And I remember being an undergrad and one time I was like, I think I had like $20 in my account. And I was like, do I get the, do I get period product? Do I get tampons that are $13? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or do I get Chipotle? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And I chose the Chipotle and I just yeah. like, kind of just took my roommate's period products. And mm-hmm. the thing about the thing that I love though about menstruators is that I've never had someone who deny me like a tampon or a pad. If right. Totally. Yeah. That is very true. Yeah. I've, I you know, think when you have them, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to share them. Nobody has an issue and they mm-hmm. understand, you know, Absolutely. But talking about that too, I mean, thinking about it in our own, like, like you're saying it's, it's, it's happening locally. It's not like you're saying in a different country necessarily. Um, There's period poverty right here in the United States. And I had read somewhere, I don't know if it was an article or not, they were talking about um, like women who are homeless or menstruators that are homeless and having to like utilize cardboard as their menstrual care products. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just can't even, I can't even imagine like that. And yeah, it's just, it, um, having access or, or there's like, I I know we're going to talk about it, but ways to, um, gift or donate period care products and stuff like that. Um, I think can make a big difference. And I know too, there's in even women's prisons, I think there's been some, if you want to talk about that, if there's anything, but I know that's been an area too, where I think any menstruators that are listening know that if you talk to some of your friends, your period periods might be totally opposite. You know, one of you might be a very heavy bleeder and it might go on for five, 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 maybe even seven days. You may have really bad cramps. And then you might have a friend that like has basically spotting and no cramps for like two days. Right. And so thinking about these women in prison situations, I think they were only allocated, they were all allocated the same amount of menstrual care products every month. And I think the, um, it was stating like the women who were bleeding more, who had heavier cycles and had to more regularly change their tampons. They had to show proof to these male guards, Mm -hmm. their bloody tampons, um, to get, more tampons or menstrual care products, which is, um, yeah. they're, you know, it's just wild. So, yeah, uh, I think specifically, I think, you know, I think in general, menstrual products should be free. Yeah. But I think particularly when we talk about like prisons and jails and these spaces where like humanity is just like completely stripped from people as mm-hmm. it is. Um, I think that that's where I sometimes get like the most emotional about lack of period care Mm -hmm. and access. And it's like, just because someone has made what the law would describe as a crime or whether or not they perceive it to be a mistake doesn't mean that they should be stripped of the humanity to properly care for their body. Particularly when, um, particularly people who have uteruses, like our uterus is so instrumental to the rest of our health. Mm -hmm. Our reproductive health is, can be so encompassing of our mental health, of our, you know, just of our hormones of just everything. And so I know there's a lot of, um, articles about it that I can absolutely send you after this, but there, um, 
there was a specific story that I read and I can't remember where it was, but it was in a woman's prison. And um, this woman was talking about how, I think they were given like maybe like one pad a day. Oh, wow. And tampons were only given in the commissary, but the commissary, like the tampon were so expensive. It would be like a month's worth of Oh my goodness. The money that they would make from working. Wow. Tampons. And so, you know, sometimes people would take toilet paper and like make sure it's their own tampons. Mm-hmm. It's just, and you know, the experience, I think, I think what m- people who don't menstruate don't understand is that there's like a specific humiliation mm-hmm. of bleeding on yourself when mm-hmm. you don't have the resources to not do that right? Mm-hmm. Like there is absolutely a movement. I, I also have an article about this on my blog called who's free to bleed. Mm-hmm. And it's about this like kind of new, like hippie movement of free bleeding, like mm-hmm. free bleed into your garden, free mm-hmm. bleed into this. I free bleed, but it's mostly like wealthy women who mm-hmm. can afford to do that. Mm-hmm. Right. But what does it mean to free bleed when let's say like people are in detention camps mm-hmm. and like little girls are in detention camps bleeding on themselves because guards aren't allowing them to shower mm-hmm. or aren't allowing them to have menstrual products. And I think that what period poverty does is it really humiliates people who menstruate like it really Mm -hmm. humiliates us in a way that like we are outside of the public eye because we don't feel comfortable going into a space and then bleeding like Mm -hmm. we watch movies and people will be like completely like severed heads and we'll be so comfortable with the blood when it's violent Mm -hmm. but when there's a period it is like the biggest deal and I Mm -hmm. think that now we're starting to see you know, periods be depicted in more like media and movies and stuff. And it makes headlines every time. Like people haven't been bleeding since, you know, the dawn of time. Right. And so I think that specifically um, with like prisons and jails, I think that part of the dehumanization of incarcerated people comes from not allowing them to manage their health. Mm. not allow them to manage their body and see their body as something that they have control or autonomy over and that's Mm -hmm. part of the machine of the of like the prison industrial right yeah yeah that's that is that's brutal um yeah I think yeah I think there's better ways for sure do you know, like, well, we're gonna, we're kind of getting there, but like talking about the donation and stuff, do you know, are there any donation, um, ways to get stuff to women who are like incarcerated menstruators or is, how does that work? Or do you, have you heard anything about that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think I'm not sure how prisons deal with uh, donations. I Mm -hmm. couldn't speak to that, but definitely with period, um, period has, we're like the biggest distributor of menstrual products in the United Mm. States. Wow. We distribute products, millions of products all the time, particularly during the pandemic. Um, but ways to get involved, um, you can contact your local period chapter. We Mm -hmm. have, we have hundreds of chapters across the, um, across the world, but particularly in States. Um, and if you don't have a local period chapter, you're more than welcome to start your own. But, but if you don't want to do that, there's options to even do a menstrual drive and reach out to period and we can send you free products free of cost. Um, but also like so much of period poverty is like the stigma of talking about it. And so mm-hmm. just even educating your friends and talking about it, like this podcast yeah. now, literally just talking about it can be so instrumental and maybe give a menstruator like the courage to talk about their own experience Mm -hmm. um period poverty yeah and then of course just like reaching out to your state representatives talking to your local council uh city council and seeing if you can get you know free product like the um on the rag how we just published um the youth activist who had gotten free products in her county and a couple of the schools you know, she really just like kept talking to people until they were mm. like, fine, you know, <laughs> it's just, um, it's really, 
is just talk, so much about it is talking about it. And I think yeah. that so many people just don't know the severity of it mm-hmm. and therefore just don't think about it. Um, yeah. But even like, you know, going in, it doesn't have to be some grand gesture of, you know, 1 million products are passed out. Mm-hmm. But even thinking about like when you go into, let's say a woman's bathroom and they have like the tampon distributors, but it's always like either there's none in there. Mm-hmm. Or it's like the terrible tampons that have like the cardboard and are super right. Yes. Right. Like just even leaving a tampon in a woman, a public woman's bathroom mm-hmm. can be like, really helpful for someone or getting your job. If you work in an office, encouraging your office to have period products in the Mm -hmm. bathroom. I think one of the cool things about the tech company that I worked for is just, there was like literal, like organic tampons and pads and amazing. um, I doll, like all of this stuff in the women's bathroom. And I was like, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That is awesome there's some changes starting to happen. I definitely think the conversation around it is changing. And I see like in the sports world too, there's a lot of male coaches like getting involved too and getting educated about just talking about periods and what, like how, like some of them aren't even aware is like how it works, like how often your cycle comes, how long do you bleed for, um, you know, what's going on with your hormones, all of that stuff. How does it affect your sleep? Like your mood, cravings. Like it's really great. Um, that we're starting to see more people get involved and educated in that arena. And I, I, I love seeing it. And in California, we just passed, um, a bill that requires, um, schools and universities to have free menstrual products available. That's amazing. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. That's California is like leading the charge. There's a couple other States that have done that as well but California like for us you know for it to be as big as it is for is definitely yeah. a great gesture wow and absolutely you're absolutely right like male coaches men in general need to be involved in the menstrual movement yes yeah absolutely yeah so free to in like is this all public schools and universities or yes that's amazing um, I'm not sure how long it will take Mm -hmm. Um, for this all to be implemented, but there is definitely there. I, I can look it up the bill. uh, Doing Um, some research. (laughs) Yes. So yeah. Um, the passing of AB 367, the menstrual equity for all act requiring free menstrual products to be provided in California schools. So yeah, I would say it's Amazing. only public schools because yeah. Yeah. Amazing. That's great. Mm-hmm. That's super. I'm super happy to hear that. Yeah. So much has changed since I was in middle school or school when I, or whenever I started my period <laughs> back in the day. Um, so I love hearing this and seeing this and then I want to be respectful of your time. I think this is so informative. I'm sure we could have gone down so many other rabbit holes and talked about all kinds of things, but, um, I think this was, I mean, again, super informational for people sharing your personal story, um, with menstrual cups and all that stuff, I think is such good information for our listeners to hear. And even for like our female athletes, being able to utilize like menstrual cups and stuff like that. Um, I think about some of our athletes who are doing like ultra races, like, and being able to have a menstrual cup in for 12 hours, like it's great instead of having to carry tampons and change tampons and stuff like that. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you happen to have your period on, on race day, um, we say that's actually one of the best times for your hormones. Um, Mm -hmm. they don't believe us at first, but once we, (laughs) once we break down what's going on with the hormones at that time, your performance is actually pretty optimal. Yeah. And you can be, and, um, your period is also some, sometimes like the most creative and like provocative yes. time for your um, brain as well. But I think social stigma, it's like, oh, this is the curse. The mother yes. is curse. We don't even explore those options mm-hmm. for that potential. Yeah. Yeah. To actually really quickly before we go, I'm just out of curiosity, do you, is there anything, I mean, you mentioned having less cramping when you switched away from tampons to menstrual cups. Is there anything else that you've noticed, heard of, researched about, um, that can 
potentially lessen someone's menstrual cramps? Um, so there's definitely like holistic, um, ways I've heard magnesium Mm -hmm. is like a really great supplement to take. Mm -hmm. Um, actually we have honestly talking, following, like there's like doulas and and things Mm -hmm. like that. Like they will offer some really incredible period management tools. I think that, you know, of course there's my doll and stuff, but sometimes people aren't always comfortable taking yeah. medication and becoming, um, having a tolerance for it. Yeah. So yeah magnesium. I've heard, I've heard, uh, like raspberry leaf tea. Um, what else have I heard? Um, I really like, um, like hot water bottles. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like a lot of new technology out. There's like yeah. this brand called Ovira, O-V-I-R-A. Hmm. Um, and they have like some really interesting, uh, technology for your periods. And I'm seeing even on TikTok, like there's these period brands that will go out and they will, they have this like machine and they'll get like non-menstruators, so mostly men uh-huh. and they'll put it on them. And be like, this is what a menstrual cramp. Oh feels my like. goodness. And they will literally <laughs> that's like, that's bend the over and like, start <laughs> crying and like they're yeah. having a heart attack. Yeah. And it's just so interesting. And it, I think it's bringing a lot of interesting conversations to social media about look what women are experiencing. Yeah. And they just act like nothing happened. Right. Like, Still go to work, put a smile on their face. Yep. And yeah. these men are literally like, yeah. Doing somersaults <laughs> from the pain. Yes. A bunch of big babies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, I think that is a good eye opener. I, I had heard something, um, two before, I think it was a doctor or researcher posted it and it was talking about like some, um, oh gosh, I think it's called PMDD where, um, your premenstrual symptoms are pretty yeah. severe and more significant than PMS, but also your cramps, I think are really bad. And they were saying that the, those with PMDD, I think their cramps can be equivalent to like, like childbirth cramps. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's wild. Um, yeah. So yeah, everyone experiences like their cycle really differently. Um, but I do think it is. Imp- I think that one thing I've also learned in my experience with periods is we've normalized so much that periods are supposed to be painful that mm-hmm. people don't actually go out and seek medical attention when they're in excruciating pain from the mm-hmm. period. Yeah. Like, it is not normal for you to be vomiting and crying and right. inconsolable when you're on your period right? That's why we have like this huge outburst of women being like, I have fibroids. I have mm-hmm. endometriosis. Mm-hmm. I have, you know, all of these different things that are go like criminally undiagnosed mm-hmm. because we've told women that this is your period. You're going to have it for 40 plus years and shut up about it. Yeah. And so I just, I think that I'm absolutely someone that's like all for holistic mm-hmm. um, ways of you know, managing your period. That's something that's been really incredible for me. But I mm-hmm. also think that is important that we sit back with ourselves and you're like, okay, is this a normal amount of pain to be experiencing? All the yeah. Time? Yeah. And most of the time it's not. And that yeah. is formally undiagnosed. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you on that. And like, I could share my whole own story about <laughs> that, that experience. But I will say I have found talking about holistic stuff. Um, I had gone through the ringer of like every, every off the shelf pain killer for menstrual cramps. Um, my doctor put me on some prescription stuff for the pain. None, none of it made a dent. I tried Mm. CBD and I found something called cramp bark. It's literally an herb called cramp Mm. bark. And that is the only thing that has made a difference like and um so I'll link that in the show notes for people if they ch- want to check it out it but some, you have to get it online is it like specific or is it's it- by the company I think it's by it's called Vitanica um mm-hmm. it's in like a green bottle um and it's a pill and you I take it like pre a little bit preemptively but you end up taking actually quite a, a few capsules is their suggestion I think on the serving size it's like you can take two to three capsules every three hours if you want, if the cramps are pretty bad, but that stuff has worked. And so I know everybody's different and, you know, depending on why the pain is happening again, if it's like endometriosis or 
high mm-hmm. prostaglandins or whatever it is, there's going to be a different treatment option. But, um, for me, this was like the big game changer for sure. Um, there's so. one more thing I just thought of if I can yeah. it really quickly. Of um, course. There's another thing I heard. Um, I think it's more for like hormonal balancing, mm. but I tried it for a little bit. I never finished it. So I couldn't tell you the full effects of it. Mm-hmm. Cycling. Um, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, there's like specific seeds. Yes. Um, I can also link there's, um, there's a like a uh, female entrepreneur who like opened up her own seed cycling and has like this really profound story about um, having an illness and then losing mm. the period and nothing would bring it back. Oh, shit. And then she started doing seed cycling. Yeah. It's the only thing that has maintained her period and her hormones. Since wow. Diagnosis. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. There's a lot of things out there. Yeah, there definitely is. We've, um, we actually have a seed cycling protocol for our clients. Um, so maybe we can link that, um, in the show notes, but yeah, the seed cycling stuff can work in it. And like you're saying there, I've seen companies now that are making their own like little, almost like seed date balls. Like you yeah. can, and you, yeah. And you just it's order so those to eat that way. Yes. So yeah. Hard to eat all those <laughs> yeah. And then switch it at the right time of the month. And yeah. So um, yeah, there, you can definitely utilize tools like that. And they're meant to kind of bring the hormones at the like similar levels to where you would want them at those phases of the cycle Mm -hmm. to help get the either normalized cycle or get a cycle back. So yeah, that's great. Um, all right. I will, we're, we're getting on time here. So I will say, um, we'll tie it up, but, um, thank you so much for your time here, Bree. And we'll include some of, uh, Bree's articles in the show notes. We'll include, include the, put a cup in it link for you guys and anything else that we talked about. We'll get that from Bree afterwards. Um, thank you again so much for your time. Thank you guys for listening and we will talk to you soon. Thank you, Bree. Thank you everyone.